Yes, ladies and gentlemen, once again, let me welcome you to this latest public lecture by the Australian National Centre for Latin American Studies in cooperation with the Embassy of Argentina. And I'd like to begin by thanking the Embassy of Argentina and the Ambassador uh, of Argentina for the support in putting this lecture on, uh, for uh, particularly bringing Guillermo Anad from Melbourne for us and for the refreshments which will follow the, the lecture. We have, I think, a very important uh, public lecture, well, it's two, in fact, addresses in this public lecture this <laughs> evening because uh, 30 years ago began uh, a new chapter in the history of Argentina after what had been one of the most brutal military dictatorships uh, that had been seen in a continent in which there had been quite a number of brutal military dictatorships. And the fall of that dictatorship and the restoration of democracy in Argentina was something that I think marked a dramatic turning point uh, not only for Argentina, but for other places in the world and other movements in the world fighting for democracy at that time, and indeed not only on the, in Latin America itself. So this is, I think, a very important anniversary to celebrate and also to analyse. And to do that tonight, we have two very distinguished speakers. First of all, the ambassador of Argentina, His Excellency Pedro Villagra Delgado, who has a distinguished background not only in diplomacy, uh, but also in academia, and therefore is extremely well qualified to talk about the history of human rights in Argentina over this last 30-year period. And to follow him, we have Dr. Guillermo Anad, who is a long-term uh, close collaborator with ANCLIS. Uh, when he was here at the ANU, he was absolutely instrumental in helping get ANCLIS off the ground uh, in the early days, when it wasn't so easy to get a crowd <laughs> uh, as this and to have virtually standing room only. Uh, so we welcome him back. And he's going to talk in particular about the resistance to the dictatorship, and in particular the Madres of the Plaza de Mayo, uh, who are internationally famous, of course, for the for the style and the nature of their resistance during the dictatorship and also for the period following the dictatorship and their continuing presence and continuing high profile in supporting democratic causes. So each of the speakers will speak for about 20 minutes and then we'll have plenty of time for questions and discussion, followed of course by the usual informal uh, talk after the meeting. So I'd like to begin and uh, please welcome with me His Excellency Pedro Villagra Delgado. Um, thank you very much, John, and I, I would like to thank uh, ANCLAS once again for the opportunity that it gives us to come to this forum and to have these presentations, and we've done some on, on Argentina and all the other colleagues from Latin America have organized also um, conferences on different topics, and it is really uh, important to see how ANCLAS has grown and the agenda of ANCLAS has grown quite significantly. I would like also to thank my, my colleagues, um, the Latin American ambassadors who in good numbers are here to the point that I think that we are running out of chairs. But this is uh, something that we have to say that we manage this just uh, for marketing purposes. So we keep fewer chairs so everything seems to be full. So it's, uh, it's not a question of, uh, that. you know, you have to do these things because otherwise. Uh, so the... Um, it is a very important occasion, the one that we are going to celebrate. On the 30th of October, Argentina will commemorate the, the 30th anniversary, celebrate, in fact, that's the word, uh, of the return of democracy to our country. To contrast between the contrast between the serious violations of human rights that took place in my country before 1983 and the strengthening of different aspects of human rights as a key component of our policy that present could not be bigger. I'll mention some of these concrete politics later, the policies that we are applying later, but first I will give an overview of how the, the history happened and what, what, is the, what happened before 1983 and after, because I think some of you are very familiar with this process, but many are not. The military junta that took over government in March of 1976, overthrowing a democratically elected government, carried out a campaign against opponents where systematic, massive, and grave violations of human rights and fundamental freedoms were perpetrated. People were abducted by military or paramilitary forces responding to the military junta, detained in clandestine centers, tortured, and eventually killed without trial or any pretense of legal process. The, the murder was never acknowledged, 
and they became the tragic symbol of Argentina in those years that disappeared, los desaparecidos. They included women, children, elderly people, and the brutality of the repression was unprecedented in our country. The methods were abhorrent, savage, degrading for the victims and for the families. Fear was one of the main traits of Argentina in those years. Many did not dare to speak or to protest against the state of events, and that could put their lives, at, obviously, at risk. However, in the middle of those dark moments, there were a few sparks of light, of courage, of decency, and the belief in the best values of humankind, which were not deterred by the threats and violence exerted by the military forces and their associates. For, for instance, a group of women whose sons, daughters, and grandchildren had been kidnapped and snatched from their normal lives, and whose fate was at risk upon not getting answers to their request for information about the whereabouts of the, their loved ones, started marching in Plaza de Mayo, the focal point of political life and government in Buenos Aires, facing the presidential palace. As the prohibition of public gathering was in force, when they first met a courageous act by itself in those days, that was 1977, they were prompted by the police to move on, to circulate. And thus, they started walking around the May Pyramid, <coughs> the monument that commemorates the start of the process of independence of Argentina in 1810. They started doing that regularly, when most other people did not dare to challenge the veil of secrecy and silence that shrouded the violence perpetrated by the junta. The act of courage was not free of moral, mortal danger. Some of these mothers were indeed kidnapped, tortured, and killed becoming themselves disappeared as their children. Of course, their actions did not stop to just marching, but they organized the search for the loved ones. But that act of publicly challenging the military junta became a potent symbol of resistance, of not conforming to the violent and unjust state of affairs, and they inspired others to follow suit in protesting against it. They were and are the mothers de Plaza de Mayo, and later the abuelas de Plaza de Mayo, to whom Guillermo Anad will refer in his talk, and thus I will not expand uh, on this, uh, this point. Other groups also there to react to the oppression and fear, the Permanent Assembly for Human Rights, in which some of the politicians, including Raul Alfonsin, was one of the members, or the Service of Peace and Justice, led by the Nobel Peace Prize winner, Adolfo Pérez Esquivel, who got the, the prize in 1980, deserved to be mentioned. The brutality of the human rights violations committed during the military government, the lack of civil liberties, the collapse of the economy because of mismanagement and acts of corruption, the almost sevenfold increase on the, on the amount of public foreign debt in only seven years to the benefit of the very few at the top of the income brackets and to the detriment of the many at the bottom, as well as the defeat at the South Atlantic conflict in which the rightful cause of the legitimate sovereignty of our country to the Malvinas, cherished by all Argentines, was used as a tool by a legitimate government, all combined to generate a wave of resistance against the military government that swept Argentina in 1982 and led to a growing demand for democracy, freedom, transparency, respect for human rights, and the return of the rule of law. The military government had to rehabilitate political parties in that year and the political process was brought back to lead the free elections, which took place 30 years ago, and Dr. Raul Alfonsín was elected president of Argentina. He was inaugurated on December 10th, 1983, and from then on, Argentina has kept a robust democracy with free elections, full respect for human rights, and fundamental freedoms, and a very intense and diverse political party system. Some will say too intense, too diverse sometimes. Dr. Alfonsín had among his priorities for the new democratic government to know the truth over the violations of human rights that had been taking place during the military rule, and only five days after being sworn in, created the National Commission on the Disappearance of Persons, the CONADEP, integrated by highly respected Argentines in order to gather elements to shed light on those tragic years, identify the victims, make the methods used in the brutal repression known, and bring to justice those responsible for those violations of human rights during the years of the military junta. The Commission's report is compelling reading even today, 30 years on. The nunca mas, the never again, as it was called, did not only reveal the extent of the violations of human rights, but also the systematic and premeditated nature of it. It also compiled a list of the thousands of people who were kidnapped and whose whereabouts were never known, those desaparecidos that I mentioned before. 
In an unprecedented move, Dr. Alfonsín brought the chief of the military governments from 1976 to 1983 to trial. He mandated that they be prosecuted only three days after taking office. Those chiefs included the presence of Argentina during their military rule. Some were convicted to the life imprisonment, others to long jail terms, and a few were acquitted of human rights violations, but were court-martialed for mismanagement of the South Atlantic conflict. In other trials, the leaders of the revolution organization, Montoneros and the People's Revolutionary Army, were also convicted, some in absentia. Besides the action to prosecute for the violations of human rights and the search for the truth of those Argentina developed develop a proactive agenda also by ratifying or adhering to crucial international instruments on human rights, such as the Covenants on Civil and Political Rights and on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, the Convention Against Star Torture, the Inter-American Convention of Human Rights, the San Jose Convention, and became actively involved in the international human rights agenda and the bodies dealing with these matters, both at the UN and in the Inter-American system. The trial of the commanders opened also the way for ju the judiciary to initiate criminal proceedings all over the country against officers of the armed services who had participated in these crimes in their jurisdictions. This led to prosecutions being started to several hundred officers in the armed forces, police, and other groups who were accused of having participated in violations of human rights. However, the military, albeit their prestige and social standards severely weakened, still were a strong force in the 1980s. And lower ranking officers in the ranks resented being prosecuted for violation of human rights in which they had indeed participated, but which were increasing in numbers. These prosecutions were becoming hundreds, as I said, as time went on, and new accusations were presented in the judiciary and new cases opened and rest spread. The government of Dr. Alfonsin gave in to these pressures, and the so called Full Stop Act which in order to stem the uninterrupt an uninterrupted flow of new cases over the next months or years, limited prosecutions to those cases which could be brought to justice before 60 days after the enactment of the, of the law. It, that made it very difficult for prosecutors to actually build a case, to have everything ready to start. This law was passed by the Argentine Congress in December 1986, which in a, in a, in a way also being similar to Australia, that, that implies that the, the, this period of time will be running during January, where we have what is called the judicial fair, so the, 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 the holidays for the judiciary. So, and that, to the surprise of many, particularly from the military, obviously, the judiciary, and especially the prosecutors and the Organization of Human Rights, worked over time. During that time, they canceled the, 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 the holidays, and they actually follow the prosecution. So at the end, in these 60 days, hundreds of cases were initiated, so they should have been prosecuted. But this led to turmoil, to further turmoil within the officer core of the armed forces, particularly in the army. A mid-rank and junior officer rose against the civilian government in different points of the country during Easter 1987. These officers alleged that whatever the participation of these low-ranking officers in the, in the violation of human rights, they were acting under orders. And their superiors from the superiors, obviously, and were therefore not criminally responsible for these acts, but the responsible were the heads. These uprisings were allegedly also not intended to produce a coup d'etat, and indeed the highest ranking officers were not part of them, but they did nothing to prevent them either. They were directed to put pressure on the government to stop these criminal proceedings being instituted before the deadline established by the full stop law, as they saw that even this law would not stop the criminal proceedings. The government of Dr. Alfonsin once again caved into these pressures, and the so-called Due Obedience Act was introduced to Congress and passed in July 1987. This law limited the possibility to prosecute criminals, those criminally, sorry, those involved in the violation of human rights, only to high-ranking officers who were responsible for issuing the orders which led to those crimes. Exceptions, and this is important for some cases in the future, were made for cases of rape, disappearances, or identity forgery of minors, not of adults, or extensive appropriation of real estate. The acceptance of the due obedience principle represented a throwback to the pre-Nuremberg trials. These laws had the effect of severely, both of them, had the effect of severely limiting the number and the scope of perpetrators of violation of human rights which could be brought to justice, and thus constituted a setback 
as they interrupted the judicial review and prosecution of crimes committed during the military dictatorship, thus providing impunity for those involved. But some sectors of the military were not even then satisfied and continued plotting against the democratic government and the newly elected President Menem invoking national reconciliation decided to issue a presidential pardon in December 1989, which included all those officers who could have been included in new prosecutions as well as those who had rebelled against the prosecutions by the judiciary earlier. But they proved not to be enough and after the new uprising in 1990, this one, a bloody one, a new presidential pardon issued in December 1990 included these commanders who had convic been convicted in the trials because the ones that I mentioned in the trials uh, conducted by President Alfonsin, and this included the commanders of the juntas and then and the military presidents who were serving jail prison terms. It had the effect also of setting free those high-ranking officers who had been convicted and were not covered by the due obedience and full stop laws. There were massive demonstrations across the country to protest against the Spartans. Are they consolidating impunity of those responsible for the grave violations of human rights and crimes against humanity committed during the military dictatorship? They were not well received from by most of society. In the meantime, since 1986, the organizations of human rights started a campaign against these impunity laws, the, the full stop and, and, and so on, attacking them as detrimental to the democratic commitment to bring to justice those responsible for those crimes and demanding the reopening of the criminal prosecutions. Those setbacks of 1986 to 1990 left a bitter taste in Argentine society as the social and political opinion was indeed in favor of ensuring that those guilty of these crimes should be brought to justice, convicted and serve their terms as a way to guarantee that impunity be rejected and that the Argentine democracy should be based in justice, transparency and truth. However, even if the revision of the past violations went through this process of advances and back steps, the full respect for human rights was not only guaranteed since 1983, but important advances in the corresponding legislation took place, such as the ratifications and full implementation of international instruments during the Alfonsin president that I just mentioned. In the reform of the Constitution in 1984, Treaties were given constitutional status, and particular human rights treaties which are included by name in the Constitution, thus being above domestic law. And this had the jurisprudence of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights became mandatory for Argentine tribunals. This had a significant positive impact in the repealing of all these laws since 2003, as I will refer later. During this process, the mothers and grandmothers of Plaza de Mayo, to whom Guillermo will refer to, continued the search for the children that were stolen from the mothers as they were kidnapped, tortured, and killed, and brought to justice these cases of appropriation of minor which had been exempted from the impunity laws in 1987. The National Bank of Genetic Data was created, which played a crucial role in allowing families of the disappeared to recover these children and to them to recover their true identity. 109 young persons have done so, and the quest continues to identify. It is estimated there may be about a couple of hundred more that could be identified. You know, they're, they're alive, but they don't know who the parents are. In the mid-1990s, legislation to compensate the victims of this violation was also enacted, and reparations were made to thousands of people affected by the victims which survived the crimes or the king of those who did not. In the context of the Lapaco case before the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, the right to truth was recognized, and that led to a new type of, type of legal proceeding that took place. They, the, the military could not be prosecuted and condemned, but these truth trials, as they were called, they, they could not produce a criminal conviction, but they had the right to identify and to, to get to know, get the information of whatever happened. So, because the, the important, we are convinced that the right to truth is one of the main contributions of Argentina to the development of international rights and human rights, and there is a, uh, then, then I will refer to a, a report on truth and, and other things. In 2001, finally a tribunal declared the unconstitutionality of the full stop and obedience. So this decision was based in this situation of including in the Constitution the human rights treaties, as as they were crimes against humanity, they could not be claimed as to have a, a, the statute of limitation, and, and the result is that they were 
Of course, they were they were they were, went on appeal, but at the end, the, the Supreme Court of Argentina they confirmed the unconstitutionality of these laws in 2005. The reversal of the laws that provided impunity for those responsible for violations of human rights and crimes against humanity was one of the priorities of President Nestor Kirchner since he took office in, in the, at the elections in 2003. This responded, in fact, to the demand of society at large led by human rights groups, as well as to his own conviction that the moral reconstruction the Argentine democracy needed could not have solid basis if justice was not done for the crimes committed during the dark times of the military rule. On the initiative of the government, those laws were repealed by Congress in that same year of 2003 as contrary to domestic and international law as they did not allow for crimes against humanity to be prosecuted. The Argentine Supreme Court, as I said, in turn, in 2005, declared the unconstitutionality of the pardons issued by President Menem in, in the 90s. As a result, hundreds of judicial processes were opened and others reopened from 2005 onwards covering the whole spectrum and scope of persons accused of having committed crimes against humanity. A thousand, more than a thousand persons have been indicted, 560 cases brought to the stage of oral trial, and, and in those trials, 430 people have been convicted for different degrees of responsibility for these crimes, and 43 were acquitted. This result marked a milestone in international law for cases of human rights violations and underlines that those which happened in Argentina will not go unpunished. It was the end of impunity and this, and it sent a powerful message also beyond Argentine borders. We're rightly proud of having led this struggle against impunity. Just to put in perspective, I, I said that 430 people were condemned in Argentina, convicted for these violations. In the Nuremberg trials, 92 people were selected to be indicted and only 22 were condemned. In the Tokyo trials, 25 were convicted, just to give simply the perspective of what we're talking about. These processes reflected the conviction of the Argentine people and the result of the hard work done by the institutions as well as by the indefatigable human rights movements in its quest for justice and by the commitment and strong political will of the authorities to ensure that the truth and justice be achieved. The combination of these factors allowed for all three branches of the state, the executive, the legislative, and the judiciary, to remove all legal obstacles in order to identify and punish those responsible for massive and systematic violations of human rights. It should be stressed that these steps were taken applying both our ordinary criminal law and international law, and through the normal judicial system. There were no special laws, no special tribunals, no changing of the normal jurisdiction would correspond to each crime and its perpetrators, and each and every instance of due process was fully respected and abide for. One of the things that I, I would like to stress here is uh, in this diversity and the variety of political parties we have in Argentina, of course we have parties which are very conservative and to the right, but on this matter, there are practically no political party that has ever complained, let's say, about the reopening of the trials and the, and the jailing of, of these people. And this is something that I, I like to, to underline. At the time of commemorating the 30th anniversary of the election that brought back democracy to Argentina, our country is pursuing an active and positive agenda on human rights, not only by rejecting impunity, but also through reparations and whatever possible restoration of the rights of the victims of the past violence and of the families and kin, but also endeavoring to ensure that all human rights are respected in daily life, be civil and political, as well as economic, social, and cultural rights. The deep economic crisis that Argentina went through at the end of 2001, and which had traumatic effect on our people and saw millions losing the savings and means of life, showcased also the importance of preserving and promoting economical, cultural, and social rights together with civil and political ones. These rights should go hand in hand, and the former should not be seen as only aspirational rights, but as concrete and enforceable ones as the latter. Policies of social inclusion and combating poverty are crucially centered in the respect of economic and social and, and cultural rights. Criteria such as the integration process seen from the perspective and hum of the human rights of the migrants in our national development, irrespective of the mig migratory status, legal or not, have passed on laws passed on gender identity, same-sex marriage, death with dignity, mental health, and the, the inclusion of mental health uh, patients in society. 
the adoption of strict implementation of a national plan against discrimination, which comes from the, the Convention on Racial Discrimination, only, but in general, from the Durban plan, which includes more than 200 criteria being applied to eradicate discrimination only from, because in all societies, we tend to say discrimination applies to race, to gender, to a couple of issues, but there are many more subtle things, many more daily life kind of things, and, and there are mechanisms in which that you can bring to the attention of the, the Institute Against uh, Discrimination in Argentina, all these kind of, of things as well, and we hope that this will become more widespread around the world. To that end, Argentina also plays an active role internationally with initiatives to promote and protect human rights globally, and it is thus a leader in the alliance to prevent genocide, the teaching of memory of crimes against humanity, such as the Holocaust, as the importance of the Holocaust is, a, is sort of emblematic in, in this massive violation of human rights in genocide, and so it, 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 has, it can have an impact also in areas or in regions where they didn't have the, 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 the Holocaust of the Jews only, and we are very active in participating in that. And uh, because the, the impact, the tragic, uh, tragic impact of the time of the military government, the right of truth of knowledge about the violation has the importance of bringing not just the closure for the families uh, of the victims and the right of identity, but the future based on truth, which is very important too. The use of forensic genetics in these fields on which, because of our tragic history, Argentina became a leading expert in the, in the world. It is of great importance to identify the remains suspected of being those of the victim of these crimes against humanity. Our team of forensic anthropology has established a close co cooperation with the Victorian Institute of Forensic Medi Anthropology and Medicine for work done in Timor-Leste and in other countries of this region. And, and the expertise of these guys is such that uh, the remains of Ned Kelly, the identification of the remains of Ned Kelly two years ago was done in Buenos Aires by this team on the basis of uh, microchondrial DNA that was taken from the Melbourne goal and, and the, because the, 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 the technology that these guys develop is precisely the one that allows you to identify remains which are very old and this requires, it is something that we learned the hard way really. Uh, this advanced technology that is not just relevant for Argentina for the case of violation of human rights in Argentina but it is for other things and also in, including for historical purposes. A couple of years ago, by the way, we had the privilege of having the, the president of the, of the team, uh, Dr. Luis von der Brieder, uh, uh, given a conference here at, at ANCLAS. At the regional level in 2011, the Institute for Public Policy and Human Rights of Mercosur started its work based in Argentina. That's allowing for institutional framework to share best practices between our countries. And in March of 2012, the Latin American Network for Prevention of Genocide was launched in Buenos Aires in association with the Auschwitz Institute for Peace and Reconciliation, with representatives for the whole region, as well as with observers from African institutions dealing with human rights. Its goal is to form public offices capable of dealing with these issues and through training and regional cooperation to educate our people and public officials in the prevention of genocide and other massive atrocities as a priority for the Latin American region, in which I have to say that we are pretty well off. In fact, uh, Latin America, since the recovery of democracy, as John mentioned, uh, in, the, in the 80s, the, the, has been a dramatic change in the, in the situation of human rights in the, in the whole region, and I think this is something we should be proud. Uh, seminars on this, uh, uh, on this um, network have been organized in Cambodia and Tanzania, besides Argentina. A, a symbol also was done uh, to the preservation of memory, the achievements of truth and justice on the violation of human rights, is that several of the clandestine centers that were used to kill, maim, torture, and, and disappear people have been converted into places of learning and cultural spaces. As a reminder of the state terrorism which uh, such devastation produced in Argentina and of the rebirth and renewal through justice and freedom. <coughs> Argentina also, by the way, abrogated the military justice code and the special jurisdiction for, for men in uniform. Thus, all crimes committed by the military are now prosecuted through the normal criminal proceedings. The importance attached to economic and social and cultural rights, as I was mentioning, there are a list of things in which we can probably talk more in the, if you are interested in some specifics. And the, we have, for instance, a program which is called in terms of our uh, migration, the Patria Grande, I mean the, the larger fatherland in which 
all the uh, the migrants from the countries in South America can uh, go to Argentina and regularize the situation. And this is something that is not very often, uh, something that doesn't happen very often anywhere in the world. We have a national plan against discrimination. We have a uh, we have created universal retirement pension in which all all the elderly has the right at least to have a pension, and even if it is not a big one, but something, even if they have not been able to contribute to the system. Same-sex marriage, of course. Gender identity in which people can, in accordance with what they feel their gender is, they can have the documents changed to express that. I mean, without having to prove any, any medical test or psychological test, it's just what you feel. It's as a... Uh, and in terms of mental health, we are uh, closing the institutions for men the mentally ill so that they can be integrated in society, except, of course, in the cases that they can indeed represent a danger for, for society or for, or for themselves. Uh, we have included um, assisted fertilization in the normal system of uh, social welfare and, and medical health. So uh, any, any, any mother or any a couple that they want to have children, uh, they, they don't need to have the mean, economic means in order to, to do it. And, uh, and we have also changed the, uh, um, abrogated the liberal laws to allow more freedom of the press. So this is something that was quite controversial, but uh, now you cannot, uh, um, Initiate actions for comments made in the press, or there were the there were the the form that was called I don't know how was the sacato the when you when you um, lack uh, lack of respect to the authorities it, it, it used to be a crime and it's it's no longer, and then of course in the international sphere we have been prosecuted for the right of truth, which is this right of every person to know the whereabouts of whatever happened to to the families or to any violations of human rights they have gone again uh, through the convention we're very active we are very active in trying to get the ratifications and certainly in the elaboration of the of the international convention against the disappearances of enforced disappearances of people because probably we unfortunately are the experts on that because of our own history and we have worked also to the establishment of the United Nations Rapporteur on Truth, Justice, Reparation and Guarantees of Not Repetition. That in that we have worked together with, uh, with Switzerland. Uh, and, uh, the, uh, and there are many, many other actions that, that I mentioned. Uh, so the tragic history of the violation of human rights in our country is made to play an active role now with new initiatives in the international fields of human rights such as, as I said, memory, truth, justice, and reparation for the victims, which is a very important part. It's not just the truth, the closure, but also the, the, the reparations for whatever happened. And of course, whenever it can be done uh, to bring things back to the state and uh, ante. And, uh, and we are also promoting forward-looking policies for social inclusion, migratory policies with the rights of migrants at the center. And uh, the goal is to build a bridge between our past experience on violation of human rights prior to the return of democracy in 1983 and the present, where these rights are not only fully respected and promoted, but where they contribute to build a more just and egalitarian society in the future. Thank you. Just before I continue and call Guillermo to the podium, uh, I'd like to welcome and thank for their attendance uh, tonight, the ambassadors of Uruguay, who I'd also like to welcome for the first time, I think, to the University and to ANCLES, uh, Colombia, Brazil, Venezuela, uh, Ecuador, El Salvador, and Chile, and a representative from Mexico as well. So, Guillermo Adad, uh, Anad has spoken many times at ANCLES, and uh, I think uh, has, uh, beg your pardon, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> And uh, also, also Paraguay. <laughs> okay. There's a danger in doing that, isn't there, when you can't say that. <laughs> uh, Guillermo has been a great friend of Ankles for a number of years, for many years now. He's taught with us here in courses uh, that we put on on Latin American studies. He will continue yeah. to do so in the future. And uh, I welcome him very much thank back very much. to the ANU. Thank you very much. Well, I'd like also to thank uh, Ankles, uh, John Mintz, and His Excellency Pedro Villagra Delgado for inviting me to participate in this event. And um, 
The Association of Grandmothers of the Plaza de Mayo is a human rights organization that has struggled for truth and justice in Argentina since 1977. They have been instrumental in establishing the right to identity in Argentina and have been recognized internationally for their work. As the ambassador was mentioned in 1976, the military stage a coup in Argentina that opened the door to the bloodiest regime that the country had ever known. The constitution was abandoned and all judicial, legislative and executive powers were concentrated in the hands of the military jun junta. The military kidnapped, tortured, and murdered thousands of people. Nobody was immune, male and female, young and old, pregnant women, students, workers, lawyers, journalists, science, artists, teachers, nuns, and priests, all were disappeared, regardless of their political affiliation. Human rights organizations estimate the number of disappeared to be around 30,000. People disappear into clandestine detention centers scattered all over the country, while the government stated that it had no knowledge of the events. The victims were shot in mass executions, thrown from airplanes into the sea, or died in captivity, often as a result of torture. The majority of the people who disappeared were young, between the ages of 16 and 35. It is estimated that 30% of the disappeared were women and that 3% were pregnant. This is the context in which the work of the grandmothers of the Plaza de Mayo can be appreciated. The aim is to locate their missing grandchildren and to contribute to the struggle against impunity in Argentina. The grandmothers pursuit of justice, their advocacy of nonviolence, and their participation in the civic dialogue regarding children's rights have put them at the center of the progressive forces that work for the creation of a truly democratic Argentina. Recovering the missing children, restoring their identities, pursuing those responsible for their abductions and returning the children to their families of origin was and is the focus of the grandmother's work. Now, how did the mothers and grandmothers of the disappear start? During the dictatorship, family members visited government offices trying to find their missing relatives and started to meet and share their personal stories. A group of mothers emerged, galvanized by the energy and charisma of Azucena Villaflor, whose son had disappeared. It was Azucena's idea to go to the Plaza de Mayo, the traditional center of civic life in Argentina, as the ambassador was mentioning, and demand of President Videla the answer to their questions about the disappearances of their children. On April the 30th, 1977, 14 mothers gathered at the Plaza de Mayo for the first time. Azucena and two other founding members, along with some of their supporters, paid heavily for their courage. In December 1977, they were abducted and disappeared. Among the mothers meeting weekly at the plaza, there were women whose grandchildren were also missing, either kidnapped with their parents or born in captivity in the clandestine detention camps. In October 1977, this group of women established the Association of Grandmothers of the Plaza de Mayo. They had one specific demand, that the kidnapped children be returned to their legitimate families. The grandmothers estimate that the number of missing grandchildren is around 500, and as the ambassador was mentioned, they have so far been able to identify 109. Where were these children? Many of the children were living with members of the police or the military who were linked to the repression. They were living under false identities with no knowledge of their history. The grandmothers emphasized that kidnapped children and children born in captivity are at risk for many reasons, such as the violent separation from their mothers, 
the concealment of their history and the systematic and continuous lies on which their family life is based. Argentina's defeat uh, in the 1982 Malvinas Falkland War led to the end of the dictatorship and elections were held in October 1983. Raul Alfonsin was elected president and his government was inaugurated on December the 10th, Human Rights Day. Shortly after, President Alfonsin created the CONADEP, the Argentine National Commission on the Disappear, which produced 50,000 pages of testimony regarding the fate of the disappear. Out of this testimony, a 500-page book, Nunca Mas, Never Again, was published, documenting the methodology used to terrorize the population. And we have here uh, President Alfonsin uh, receiving the, the work of the commission, the CONADEP, uh, on behalf of uh, Ernesto Sabato, who chaired the, the commission, among other influential intellectuals, as Tim Basso has mentioned. In April 1985, members of the three military juntas were charged with 711 count, counts of murders, illegal detention, torture, rape, and robbery. The trial of the century, as it was called in Argentina, took place and marked an important moment in Argentina's history. It was the first time that members of the military had been brought to trial and convicted. After the trial, military threats to the government continue. In 1986, in an effort to appease the military, laws were passed, Punto Final and Obediencia de Vida, which granted immunity to a large number of potential defendants. The next president, Carlos Menem, under the guise of pacification and reconciliation in 1990, issued a pardon for all the junta members who had been tried in 1985, and who were still serving their sentences. These laws, popularly known as impunity laws, as the ambassador was saying, did not identify crimes of child abduction, concealment of identity, and falsification of civil status. Later, these were the grounds upon which members of the military were prosecuted. The grandmothers of the Plaza de Mayo led the search for justice. Forensic science developments. Upon the return of democracy, hundreds of mass graves were found all over the country. Exhumations began, but they were primitive and unreliable. In the early 1980s, the grandmothers met with the members of the CONADEP and urged them to seek advice on exhumation techniques from the human rights and science program of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Dr. Clyde C. Snow, a world-known forensic anthropology, anthropologist from the United States, visited Argentina and trained local scientists in archaeological techniques needed and, and helped uh, create the Argentine uh, Forensic Anthropology Team, an organization that applies forensic science, uh, sciences to investigation of human rights violations. From a study of pelvic bones, it was determined that some of the pregnant women who had been kidnapped and murdered had given birth. This new information made it possible for the grandmothers to begin the search for these children born in captivity with increased certainty of their existence. This issue of identity is central to the work of the grandmothers. They became the driving force. They became the driving force for the creation of a national genetic data bank established in 1987 during the government of President Raúl Alfonsín. At this bank, blood samples of relatives of the missing children are deposited, so that even after the death of the grandparents, it will be possible to establish the identity of the children. This bank began modestly with just a table and a chair at the Carlos Duran Hospital in Buenos Aires. Today, it is one of the most prestigious laboratories in the world, equipped with sophisticated resources and a staff of 30 geneticists. The grandmothers were instrumental also in judicial change. The grandmothers conceptualized a new human right, the right to identity, 
by which states must respect the right of a child to her or his identity, including nationality, name, and family origin. In the child's identity, if the child's identity is denied, the state must work to restore it. In November 2009, the Argentine Senate approved a law aimed to identifying children and grandchildren of those who disappeared during the last military dictatorship. The law authorizes judges to order that biological samples be taken to determine the identity of people in judicial proceedings involving crimes against humanity. The grandmothers pressured the, gov the Argentine government to lobby for the right to identity at the United Nations Working Group, drafting a convention on the rights of children. The right to identity is now part of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, already ratified by 191 states and currently the most widely accepted human rights treaty in history. In Argentina, the right to identity has led to new legislation in the area of adoption by which adopted children have the right to know that they were adopted and by age 18 have full access to their adoption records. The grandmothers are also responsible for the creation in 1992 of the National Commission for the Right to Identity, which centralized efforts to locate the children disappeared during the military dictatorship and had powers of both investigation and prosecution. It is now part of the Ministry of Justice and Human Rights. Probably one of the most successful actions the grandmothers took was establishing the charge that the military had elaborated a systematic plan to kidnap the children of the disappeared. In 1996, six grandmothers, armed with new evidence collected through their many years of investigation, argue that the kidnapping of children was not the isolated work of a few corrupt individuals, but a carefully crafted systematic plan by the military commanders to punish the families of the so-called subversives. This new charge resulted in the detention of 11 military officers, including General Videla and Admiral Macera, members of the Pardon First Junta. This was one of the most significant legal challenges to impunity. The case, widely known in Argentina as robo de bebés, a theft of babies, prompted the military to challenge the right of the civil courts to judge them. In the landmark decision in 2005, Argentina's Supreme Court ruled that the existing impunity law, as the ambassador was commenting, protecting former military officers were unconstitutional, invalid, and that they violated international treatises that signed by Argentina. The impunity laws were thrown out. Now, in, I would like to comment on international outreach and recognition of the grandmothers of Plaza de Mayo. A striking aspect of, of the work of the grandmothers has been their outreach for international solidarity. During their first two years, they contacted more than 150 international groups, including the United Nations, the Vatican, the Organization of American States, the World Council of Churches, the international human rights community, foreign newspapers and journalists, and prominent politicians. In addition to changes within Argentina, as previously mentioned, the grandmothers have increased the international community's awareness of the horrors of state terrorism. Working with the Argentine Minister of Foreign Affairs, the grandmothers helped to draft and present an article to the United Nations Working Group. This article was ultimately incorporated into the United Nations Conventions on the Right of the Child and is commonly known as the Argentine Article. 
In 2010, the UNESCO Peace Prize was awarded to the grandmothers of the Plaza de Mayo in Argentina for their, quote, tireless battle for human rights and peace by standing up to oppression, injustice, and impunity, unquote. By recovering the identity of their grandchildren, the grandmothers began the essential process of constructing a historical and inclusive Argentine social identity. Their work restores hope in the value of peaceful human rights activism. Now, to sum up, Argentina has a contentious history and has suffered periods of violence and repression. Nevertheless, since the return of democracy in 1983, there have been groundbreaking developments in the areas of justice and human rights. The grandmothers of the Plaza de Mayo are an emblematic example of this. Advances in forensic anthropology, establishment of the genetic data bank, the right to identity, the search for truth and justice, and the international recognition has have set the example for future generations inside Argentina and around the world. Uh, to end, I'd like to share with you um, um, some um, photos of, well, here we have Estela de Carlotto, is a long-standing and a driving force president now uh, of the grandmothers of the Plaza de Mayo. Um, the mothers and abuelas de Plaza de Mayo uh, have also been acknowledged uh, since the return of the democracy in Argentina at, at different levels. They, there's even a, a secondary school named uh, Escuela Madres y, y Abuelas de Plaza de Mayo in the province of Buenos Aires in Moreno. Uh, they have also, there's a garden inaugurated in, uh, opened in 2008 in Paris. It's called uh, the Garden of the Mothers and Grandmothers of Plaza de Mayo. And here's Estela Carlotto in the opening. And this is Juan Cavandier, uh, who, who was born in ESMA and, uh, in 1978. And uh, today he's a high profile politician. He's the, the, the son of the, her parents remain disappeared. And um, he's uh, standing as an M MP for, for the city of Buenos Aires. And uh, he's one of the uh, children who recovered. Uh, he, he, he got in touch with the grandmothers of the Plaza de Mayo when he was 26. And uh, so a few years ago, a song, uh, Leon Gieco, who is one of the most influential uh, singer, rock singer and songwriter in Argentinian history, wrote a song um, dedicated to him. It's called Yo Soy Juan, I Am Juan. <laughs> Well, regarding the first part of the, the dirty war, uh, even in war, there are rules. The things that were done in Argentina could not have been done even if you will accept there was a war. There wasn't a war. In fact, there was a, an internal uh, a rising, if you like, for the military government, which was not legitimate in the first place. But then even if, even if you will accept that there was war, in war you cannot kill and torture and do the things that were done in Argentina. That's why they are in jail. Regarding the, the, the second question, the military has changed dramatically. And of course, human rights is a mandatory thing in, the, in all the institutions of the military. One of the things that I, I think that in, in Argentina in particular, the military has lost all political power. And this is something acceptable in the military. And that's one of the good offsprings of what happened in, in, in the, not just in the, with the return of democracy, but also because of the impunity laws being repealed, repealed, but even in the, I would say that even in the 90s, when these changes were taking place, the military was suffering, uh, undergoing a very, very strong change in the attitude, precisely what you say. First of all, in Argentina, the military cannot participate in any actions within the country. 
That's why many times one of the discussions have been, for instance, when you have problems with the with uh, drug trafficking or problems of uh, civil turmoil of any sort, we have the piqueteros, the people that stop the, the roads, and the military can never be used for these kind of purposes in Argentina. And this is a, an essential thing, what you said is, the military are a force that has to protect the country against external aggression. They cannot act internally. And this is something in which we're very strong. And this has, and this is something that every civilian government since the return of democracy has been very keen in applying. And we had a result, I would say, when we had the crisis of 2001, there was lots of people in the streets and all that, the military didn't play any role at all. And that's what they, nobody expected them to, No, would have they played any role. And this is a change that may uh, seem subtle, but it's very substantial. The military are, they, they devoted to their own activities, which is that they should be in every country. We are not vying for any leadership role, but we are trying just to do what we think is right. And as I mentioned in, in my presentation, we are doing these things in Argentina. Not, not just the, the, the looking back at the past and the reparations to the past, but the, I, I mentioned some forward-looking things, in things that have nothing to do with the violations of human rights of the 70s, e gender equality, uh, the rights of the of all the, the the disadvantaged sectors of society, the ones that have less, the 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 actual enforcement of uh, economic, social, and cultural rights, and and in that, even if you do the best within your country, the it won't happen much if you don't try to do this through the international organizations. We are not going to try to be preaching to anyone, but we try to do it. That's why we have a very strong international system of human rights through the through the Council of Human Rights of the UN, through the Inter-American system, through the systems that apply in different parts of the world. Argentina has a very good connection with many of the, um, of the human rights institutions of uh, uh, regions like uh, with, the, with the African Union and with, the, with some Asian groups of, uh, of human rights. And I think this is the way, of course, with, the, with Europe and with the United States, uh, with Australia, we have very good relationship and very good communication in the, in the, in the Council of Human Rights. We have always had it. And, that, and this is something that uh, international law of human rights is something that we want to be not a leader in the sense of saying, well, we are the best. I mean, we are the, the best student and all that. But we certainly are very active and we think that we should all be because this is something that is done with everyone or else things do not happen. Yeah, but it's certainly true also that it's also the case that the, the world has been watching Argentina's oh, yes, process after. And in, in, especially in what international uh, relations is called the, the, the field of transitional uh, justice, you know, uh, the, uh, societies that are trying to recover from uh, such a traumatic uh, period of, of repression and, and, and state-sponsored terrorism and violence. Uh, so it's, it's undeniable that Argentina has been uh, uh, producing some groundbreaking, groundbreaking uh, uh, work. And, and, and the, the world is, is looking, and uh, there are students around the world uh, studying law that uh, are studying uh, Argentinian cases. And um, yeah, yeah, so it is. Uh, it's certainly the world. The world is looking. Well, in 1976, Argentina was going through a process of turmoil, internal turmoil. That's clear. But we had a, a democratically elected government, and the institutions were trying to work. So it, the the coup. What the military will say is that there was a demand for order, but order, that was the order of the, of the cemeteries, the one that was uh, applied. And uh, one of the things that uh, was uh, rejected is because the government, even if they will say that the previous government were, that they overthrown was uh, mismanagement, the country, the economy, whatever, that's what elections are for. We had elections at that time um, coming in a year's time. So obviously there were some some changes that were done as well, I mean, in the terms of the, the economy. Uh, of, um, as I mentioned, some of the, of, the, of the economic changes that were done in Argentina and the military actually are the ones that indebted Argentina enormously to the, to the benefit of just a few people uh, to the detriment of, of all the rest. I mentioned this figure that uh, in the seven years of the military junta, the foreign debt of Argentina increased 700%. And that was 
the big burden that then had to be dealt with by all the civilian governments afterwards. As, I, as, as, as we were mentioning, uh, when, when the, the military took over in 1976, um, at the very beginning, in the few days, Everybody had the sense that well, okay, it was one more, it could be one, just one more coup. And uh, oh, the, we, as we, we say it's, it's undeniable in our history that we had had some uh, other coups and uh, the, the military had been involved uh, systematically in Argentine politics since the 1930s, uh, the, uh, the first overthrow of the, Irigo um, the democratic government of Irigoyen. And uh, ever since, the, uh, the, the, the military have been um, involved in, uh, in Argentine politics. So uh, everybody at the very beginning, including the media, uh, was uh, hoping that, okay, it, w it will pass in a few days. Uh, and um, it, it, it turned out as, as, uh, that it wasn't. And um, we also have to look at the bigger picture of uh, and there was a question here about the justification. Also, the military, uh, the, the, the bigger picture in, in terms of international uh, relation was also the Cold War. And, and, and the military uh, saw themselves uh, as an um, emblematic force fighting against uh, the threat of communism and Argentina becoming another Cuba. You know, the, the Cuban revolution had been successful. And... Um, Coming to your question, at the, at the, at the very beginning, the, the mainstream media uh, it was, uh, it was regarded by the, the one who opposed the, the military as compliance and, and uh, not doing it enough uh, opposition. And, uh, but uh, as, as the time passed, and uh, for example, I mean, the, the mothers and grandmothers uh, and uh, mothers and abuelas de Plaza de Mayo have been instrumental also in, in, in doing, in making this issue more visible to international media and also the, the, the impact that the, the work and the resistance of the mothers and abuelas de Plaza de Mayo had in international media also uh, had an impact in our uh, uh, newspapers and, uh, and TV. But, um, uh, in Clarín, uh, especially, they, which now it became a, a multimedia empire, um, some uh, mothers of Plaza de Mayo managed to, to publish a, a, a list of uh, desaparecidos towards the end of the, of the dictator. And, and uh, Jorge Luis Borges mm -hmm. uh, signed a petition uh, together with other intellectuals uh, asking for uh, answers to be to be uh, questions to be answered in, in terms of the, the, the faith of the disappeared, and uh, that was in 1981. Uh, so the media, bit by bit, uh, started to catch up, and there was also alternative media, radio, and uh, magazines that um, kept the, the awareness of what was going on alive. No, no, they, uh, that would be unfair because there were there were many countries that actually had an active role in 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 condemning the military government while it was happening. A case in point was uh, President Carter of the United States, and that's something that uh, it has to be recognized that he played a crucial role in that. And in Europe, also many European countries, some Latin American countries, also played a role in in. We had lots of military governments at the time in Latin America, so obviously the military government were not particularly uh, <laughs> keen in, in criticizing the others, but there were some others, like uh, Venezuela or, or Colombia, even some of the Costa Rica, that they played quite a... Mexico received lots of, uh, of uh, refugees from Argentina in those, in those years. And, uh, and there were, of course, the... And, of course, some of the socialist countries also criticized and some supported the, the military because of this division in the the Cold War thing, because one, one surprising thing is as, as the military got in Argentina, not in other countries in Latin America, but they got uh, a sort of a clash with the, with the American government, immediately they, they were considered in a way, which is crazy, they were the, the, the harbingers of the fight against communism, but in a way they sort of got allies in the, in the socialist world because they were just against the United States. 
in, in that sense. But it has to be said that there were some people that actually played a, a very important role in, in, uh, in, in pressuring the military to do things. For instance, uh, the help of some of the Latin American countries and the, and the, the United States played a role in, in having the, in the visit of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights to Argentina in 1979 that was the first time that the military had to acknowledge and to visit the, the detention center. So that was a very important moment, and the, the Inter-American Commission produced a very thick volume on the violation of human rights in Argentina in the, in the early 1980. So there was, uh, uh, as Guillermo was saying in the press, in, it was internationally. Many people learned what was happening in Argentina through the international media rather than the local media because one thing that has to be said also to the uh, question put by the ambassador of Ecuador, the repression was particularly brutal against journalists that were opposed to the regime. And so that's the, it's not that they, to be uh, a journalist in those times was uh, an opposing the regime, particularly in the first four years of the government, was not, uh, it had to, it required some courage. Not just, not just I myself, that in academic study of military regimes, there are many systems of classification, but one of the forms of classification has been military regimes which have attempted or seen themselves as temporarily restoring order and then handing power back to civilian governments after a relatively short period, and therefore leaving the, 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 the largest part of civil society untouched. Argentina, in those classifications, generally stands out as the opposite mm -hmm. to that, as a military which had a serious intent to reshape society for all time and therefore to take control of all sorts of elements of society with which the military had had virtually no contact. The press, obviously, but even sporting clubs in some cases with military officers overseeing and and at all sorts of institutional levels. So it was a you know, particularly deeply embedded uh, military, I think, in Argentina. Uh, some face um, justice, yes, there are uh, cases of the Capellano, um, of the, you know, the, the, because the, 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 the police, the parapolice and the military had the, the uh, in Argentina, had uh, heavily uh, been supported by, by the official side of, of, of the church. Uh, but it needs to be said also that there, there, there were some honorable exceptions too, uh, like Jaime de Nevares, a, a bishop from Neuquén, who was a member of the CONADEP too. And uh, I personally uh, knew of a priest in La Plata, the city where I was living when I was a child. Uh, uh, my parents uh, befriended this uh, priest who was part of the theology of liberation, uh, no, not necessarily main, mainstream uh, church, and uh, he was a close friend of, the, of our family. Uh, and um, this uh, young priest was very active in social I issues, uh, working preferably with, with the poor, and very heavily involved in, in, in social activism. And um, my father used to l lend him the car. And uh, my father got the news that he had been seen with my, using my father's car. And um, um, to make a long story brief, uh, my father, and through my father, this priest was warned that he had two days to leave the city, and he migrated to Neuquén, to where he became a high-profile uh, priest, and issued um, one um, uh, uh, sort of uh, paper uh, forbidding members of the military dictatorship entering his church. That was very brave. That was uh, towards the end of the dictatorship, and it became a well-known case. It, it's it's an it's an excellent point. It's 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 it's, it's, it's not black and white. And uh, yes, uh, there's estimated uh, 500 uh, children uh, are disappeared. They have uh, uh, re restored the uh, uh, the real identity of 109. 
but um, it is uh, the, the, it is complex, and there's been the case like the the, um, the Clarine. No? Uh, uh, there's been cases in which, for example, uh, in, in, as I mentioned previously, in uh, in Argentina, the biggest media empire, uh, equivalent to Murdoch Press, in Argentina is Clarín. It's a medium empire: newspapers, uh, website, radios, uh, TV, everything. Uh, now, uh, that is um, run by Ernestina Noble de Herrera. Uh, she adopted uh, ki uh, two children in 1976, and uh, it was a case that was heavily publicized and politicized by the government, too, and uh, there were pressure for uh, to, to, to really know the identity of these two. They are Felipe and Marcela. They are uh, a boy and a girl. Well, now they are in their early 30s. And uh, they didn't want to know. They, they were happy to stick to the narrative uh, that the, their so-called uh, mother uh, has um, uh, said to them, and there are a lot of people who really doubt if they are really uh, uh, her, her uh, children, but uh, uh, they, they eventually they have to comply with some kind of uh, samples of uh, DNA, and it's, it's, it's still an ongoing case, and it was very, it is, it is very, uh, it's, it's complex and it's, it's, it's very difficult. In, in the end, some, some people uh, don't want to, to do it. But uh, there are two conflicted, uh, conflicting rights, if you want, the right to privacy and the right to the truth, competing each, in each other in this issue. Uh, 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 by, uh, I would never say that it's, it's, it's simple. Just before we conclude uh, the meeting, I'd just like to uh, do an advertisement, which is Anklos, as you know, has many, many activities happening all the time. Next week we have uh, a very interesting meeting, I think, on the political legacy of Simeon Bolivar. And the lecture will be given by Professor Steve Elner, who's uh, an eminent historian of Latin America, has written many books uh, about Latin America, in particular Venezuela, where he's lived the last 38 years. And next week will be that public meeting on Bolivar, and uh, it'll be co-sponsored by the Embassy of Venezuela. So please uh, feel free to turn up next week. And if you're not on the Ankles email list, there's a list outside, near, somewhere near the wine, I think. Um, but finally, let me thank once again Ambassador Vijago Delgado, Dr. Guillermo Renard, and all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you.